We're glad that you could join us and be a part of our investigation and exploration of the Word of God so that we might discover truths that will transform and help us to walk in a manner that is worthy to the Lord and pleasing in every respect, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, Colossians chapter 1 and 10. That's what we're attempting to do here is to grow and to mature in the truth. And the only way to do that is when we are rightly connected to the word of God and to the, our relationship with him, because in him is truth. The truth is in the word of God and Jesus is the truth. And so the more we engage him and engage in, engage in the study of the word of God, the more we're exposed to the truth. Exposure is one step in a larger movement towards God. Once you're exposed to the truth, understand the truth, then the next step is to do what? Appropriate the truth, apply the truth, exercise the truth. And so that's what we're doing here at this church is learning the truth to apply the truth. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful and thankful this morning that you called us into this marvelous light and that you are revealing to us knowledge and wisdom and understanding we pray that the insight that we discover through the study of the Word of God will become the means by which we process our relationship first with you, then with ourselves, and then with the world in which we live. That we will be reflective in what we do of who Christ is. The Bible declares that we should walk by the Spirit so that we will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so we are engaged in fruitful walking in the Spirit of God. And we thank you that you called us to this at this hour, called this moment at this hour to be reflective of Christ in all that we do, all that we think, and all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we will continue in our study of the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, and verse 1. And in verse 1, uh, we are picking up on the expectation that Paul has for us to be distinctive from the world, to be in the world but not of the world, that we are reflective of a transformed life in how we conduct ourselves and engage the world in which we live with a divine perspective. Perspective is the faculty of seeing all of the relevant data in a meaningful connection, in a meaningful relationship. A divine perspective gives us the ability to connect the dots, if you will, of life and living and what's going on in the world in which we live. And so we bring that divine perspective in how we engage the world and how we live out our lives in a way that is pleasing to him. Paul calls us to that. He calls us to a relational re relational connection with the author of life, that is God himself. And, and, as, and as we engage our study today, I want us to recognize that Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. We see that in our study thus far. That we are men and women who are engaging the world we live in, not based upon what we see, but what God has communicated to us within the word of God. We are practitioners of the truth. Amen? We are working out our soul salvation with fear and trembling. We are putting into practice what God has revealed to us within the word of God. The goal of God is to change us, to change us from what we were before we knew him into the image and likeness of Christ. Thus, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That is, you and I have a need to have a changed mind. And there is a process through which that takes place. It is not an, a, 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 an event that takes place overnight, but rather it's an event that happens over time. We call it sanctification. Transformation is a process. 
The more you know, the more you grow. Rate multiplied by time equals spiritual growth. Our growth and maturity in God cannot happen apart from the study of the Word of God. There are many who are claiming to be Christians today. But their Christianity is weak and anemic because they're not rightly connected with the study of the Word of God. Or they're engaged in studying other things that may be talking about the Bible as opposed to studying the Bible so as to engage those things that talk about the Bible. It's not the reverse. It is the Bible that provides the filter through uh, discerning authenticity and inauthentic uh, representations that are happening around us, and particularly in the body of Christ. So you and I are being exposed to God's truth to facilitate a transformation of our minds. You cannot bring worldly philosophies, worldly perspectives into your analysis of what's going on in the scriptures. You can't do it. God is the creator of the heavens and the universe and the seas and all that is in them. He created them. He designed them and he has a purpose for everything that he has created. You, do you know he has a purpose for you? You're not just called to be sideline Christians to cheer the pastor and spiritual leaders as they practice their faith, but rather you are to learn what God expects of you and then apply, appropriate that learning in your day-to-day -day routine of life. And when you do so, you fulfill your destiny in the kingdom of God, which is to advance that kingdom in which you do. And so Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight. By faith and not by sight. That seems to suggest to me that it's not what you see that matters, it's who you know. And faith means that our confidence, and that's what faith means, confidence and trust in what God has said that brings to us stability of life and purpose. And it provides for us the ability to walk in the physical world without intimidation or concern about what will happen that is outside the purview of the purposes of God. Amen? Amen. God's in control. Paul is bringing us to that awareness right here in this book. And so as we enter into our study of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I want you to notice verse 1. It says, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. The grace of God in vain. Let's look at that for a moment. He says, I urge you not to receive this grace. We said that grace is unmerited favor. God get doing for us what we do not deserve. We do not deserve. We do not deserve this relationship that God has given to us. In fact, when he found us and dispersed or dispensed to us grace, we were in a position of condemnation. How many of you know that? That we were condemned and the condemnation was because of sin. Not sin that you are necessarily responsible for. You weren't there when the sin that condemned us took place, but out of Adam's sin, condemnation, came to all of humankind, right? It's in the DNA. It's in the DNA. And so God came and delivered us from that sin. He brought to us deliverance, and he did it through grace. Unmerited favor. Favor. He favored us and delivered us from sin. But before we get to that point, Paul says something that's curious to me. He says, working together with him. Do you see that? Working together with him. At this point, he suggests to us who are born again Bible believers that we have an assignment that includes working alongside of the purposes of God. 
working alongside of and pursuing the purposes of God in our lives and in relationship with him. Do you see that? Working together with him, that is with God. And it, it is a capital H-I-M. Do you see that? Capital, that's, that him there is God himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The triune God who created all things for a purpose. This is not something that is unfolding, you know, uh, without any purpose or without any direction. We're living in a world that is designed and has purpose connected to it. And God has, through our rescue, invited us in to work alongside of him to advance that purpose. What is God doing right now that you and I ought to be engaged in? What he is doing is that he is extending the gospel message in order to rescue humankind, those who have been chosen, out of the condemnation that is here and is to come. Hello? Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. All power and authority has been given unto me, and what I, have given, I give unto you, he says, go ye therefore, and make disciples. Every believer that is sitting under the sound of my voice and is hearing this on live stream have an obligation, have a stewardship responsibility to make disciples by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the good news. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, that you and I might be set free and delivered from the bondage of sin. The bondage of sin. The word bondage means that we were slaves to sin. Not only slaves in terms of conduct and behavior, which only is an, a, a representation of how one thinks, so our minds, our thinking, apart from God, is enslaved to sin. Doulos is the Greek word there. It means that we're listening to a voice that is dominating us. A satanic voice and also the voice of the flesh who is an enemy of God and rebellious towards God. The flesh on its own, without Satan's influence, is rebelling against God. God delivered us from that, called us into relationship with him, that we might advance his good news to those that he selected before the foundations of the earth were formed to be a part of the family of God. So isn't it interesting, he says here, men and women, that you are working together with him. Don't miss that. But where I want to point our attention is that he says, don't take this grace in vain. You, don't take this salvation that God has given to us in vain. The Greek word therefore vain is kenos. Kenos means empty, hollow, meaningless, aimlessness, aimlessness, meaningless. You received it, but it has no power, no strength in it. Because you're not using it. Uh, a further definition of it is found in one of the Greek uh, manuals that I am using. It says this. It means unaccompanied with the demonstration of spirit and power. Unaccompanied, receive the salvation, but it's not accompanied with spirit and power. Use not of things, but of persons. And so when we say that's a vain person or that's a vain action, uh, it is not connected with inanimate objects. It's connected with animate objects, you and I in particular and specifically. He says it's, it's, it's used not of things, but of persons. It's predicated not merely on the absence of good, 
but also since a vacuum does not exist in man's moral nature, the presence of evil is in there. And hear that. Now, I, I, I like this definition as I looked at it. I'm going to tell you, I had to look at it several times with what it was saying. It says it's predicated not merely on the absence of good. So when we say that it's empty and hollow, it's hollow and empty of good. But because man does not have a vacuum, it doesn't mean it's just empty with nothing in it. What are you saying? It's empty of good, but what's occupying it is evil. Do you see that? So he says, do not take this grace in vain. Not using it, not exercising it. But when we do that, he says, evil fills the void. Evil fills the void. Don't take this grace in vain. Turn to James chapter 2. I think James says something very similar. In James chapter 2, when you get to chapter 2, I want you to go to verse 20. When you get to say amen, amen. He says, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? You see that? Faith without works is useless. Now, in order to understand it, I think from uh, the intensity of what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you've got to use the King James Version. So let's go to King James. Uh, I mean, if you, if you don't have it, I'm going to go to King James. All right. And in King James, same verse, same chapter, James chapter two and verse 20. And it reads, I think, a little bit more powerfully when James, when it says here, but wilt thou know, O vain man, New American Standard says, you foolish man. When you look in the Greek, both those words are kenos. The Greek word is kenos. You vain man, that faith without works is dead. Is dead. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. Don't take the grace of God in vain by not working it. Not using it unaccompanied with a demonstration of spirit and power. Every believer ought to be exercising a faith that is demonstratively powerful because it's reliant upon the spirit of God that dwells within. Every one of us has the third person of the Godhead residing in us. Amen? Amen. When you confess Christ, the only way that you can confess Christ is that the Spirit of God is resident within you. The only way that you and I have the capacity to even receive it is because God has produced in us the capacity and the ability to receive it. If God doesn't move, your original condition of sin does not allow you to move. And so the regenerative power of the Spirit of God comes and causes us to have the capacity to hear it and then to use it because he's there engineering it and orchestrating our salvation. Salvation is from God, not from man. Amen? And so he says, don't take this thing in vain. Don't take it in vain. He goes on. Uh, look at Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Now we'll go back to the New America Standard. Second Thessalonians. And when you get to Second Thessalonians, look at chapter 2 and verse 1. Amen. He says, now, chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, now we request you, brethren... With regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, but be 
and, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as it is from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Okay? He says, now be careful that we don't get caught up in the charisma of a, uh, a, a personality that is out there representing misinformation to us. And that's what we get. Now go back to Second Corinthians chapter 6. He says, And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he said, At an acceptable time, I listen to you. Wow. I listen to you. God hears us. And responds to our needs and what is best for us out of our cry to him. This harkens us back to the nation of Israel in Egypt. He says, I, I've heard your cries and I am coming to deliver you. I listen to you and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable Time, behold, now is the day of salvation. Men and women, that's exactly where you and I are living right now. We're living in the day of salvation. And it's not the time that Christ has already come. And there's going to be voices out there that says that. And particularly as we approach uh, April chapter, uh, April 8, there's going to be some people saying, Christ has come, he's here, right? But we know better than that. Keep your eyes fixed on him. So you and I need to keep our eyes fixed on him. And notice he says, now is the day of salvation. The offer of salvation is now. Right now. And let me tell you, there's going to come a time when that offer is off the table. Hello? When that offer is off the table, the offer of salvation is now. And so those of you who are listening who do not know Christ, the offer of salvation is now. Now, you don't know whether you're going to make it tomorrow. You may not make it to the end of this day. And so the time for receiving the truth of salvation is right now. Right now. I, I like the urgency that is connected there. Now, the idea that's in verse 1 is that we're working together with him. Not in a capacity of equality. You're not equal with God. We, we are in fellowship and in relationship with him in servitude to his purpose. Amen? Look at verses 3 through 5. Uh, he says here, giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited. But in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance in infliction afflictions in hardship in distress in beatings in imprisonments in tumult in labor in sleeplessness in hunger in pure in purity in knowledge in patience in kindness in the holy spirit in genuine love in every circumstance be it negative or be it good we serve God and it's a consistent servant that stands up in the face of opposition and serves God why am I saying that I happen to believe that persecution is coming to America for Christians. Uh, now when I say coming, I mean coming with more intensity than it is now because we are already under persecution. Amen. 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 Now this um, Friday in Friday night's Bible study with our men, uh, we introduced to them before we started our lesson a uh, an article that was released I think last week that spoke to what Canada is doing with the Christian community in Canada. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, others of you may have not. But uh, the headline reads, Canadian uh, Can Canada moves to ban Christianity 
changes to Bill C-367. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means that to the, the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ will be processed through that particular legislation. And if it meets their criteria of acceptability, it could go forward. If it doesn't, then you are subject to punitive consequences that includes jailing. That's not in America now, but I believe it's coming. Under the guise of, quote unquote, hate speech. The article says this, if you allow me. It says, Can uh, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has passed numerous pieces of legislation prohibiting free speech in Canada. Yet nothing has been as restrictive as Bill C-367. An amendment to the criminal code that will prohibit can uh, Canadians from experiencing an opinion based on belief in religion and in the religious text. If passed, people can be arrested for quoting the Bible on Canadian soil. For quoting the Bible. You know what that's targeted towards? Any quoting of scripture that speaks against the LGBTQ agenda. You can't say, you, you can't say in Canada, same-sex marriage is wrong. Transgenderism is against God. Gender fluidity. Hormone blockers. It's against God and the purpose of God. You can't do that. You won't be able to do it. That's where things are going. And I believe it's going to go there pretty quickly. And so Paul says, no matter what the circumstances are, you stand because you are a servant of the Lord. In the good times and in the bad times. You see, it's, it's easy to serve God when things are going good. And that's how it's been in America. We, we've had it pretty good. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all that stuff. But it's in jeopardy now. Let me remind you that when COVID hit, the government shut down the churches. The government did. Told them they could not meet. And if they did meet, told them how many could meet and that they had the social distance while, they're, why, while they were there and that they couldn't sing. Don't sing because you may spray somebody when you... That's where we are. And the churches shut down. A lot of them did. And surprisingly, a lot of them were still shut down in, in January of this year. And then just now opening up. Because they're operating in fear. Because they had some preacher who was taking, you know, a dime. Or what the kids call today, taking the bag. They were taking the bag and keeping the churches shut down. And making their people go get the shots. Wow. wow. I know one church that didn't do that. Amen. Bless that church. That, that must have been a pastor who was listening to God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so he says here, no matter what the circumstances may be, three through five, or actually three through six, no matter what it is, we are God's servant and we serve his purposes in the good times and in the bad times. Believers that you need to understand that now. You understand it now so when it comes you still stand. For me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. Do you believe that? Or do you have fear that you know uh, if I say this I might get hurt? You know, say it! Because the person who's threatening you may need to hear it. And that may be your only salvation. Is that he hears it and says, oh, this is wrong. But if you don't say it, you're going out. So he wants us to know that we are servants. Servants of God. Now keep going with me. In verse 6, it's the servants 
who is known by pure speech, pure conduct, pure motives, and a deep love for people. That's in verse 6. And genuine love. He ends that there. But verse 7, he says, in the word of truth is where we get this power. In the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness, notice that, for the right hand and the left, weapons of righteousness. Righteousness is a weapon against unrighteousness. And so you and I ought to be acquainted fully with righteousness because it's a shield. It is a uh, offensive weapon for us against those who are attacking the Bible, Jesus, and our faith. And our faith. Put on the full armor of God. There's two things that, that is a directive in that passage in Ephesians. It says, put on the full armor. And then it says, take up the full armor. That, that means when you got it on, use it. Amen? Use it. We're in a battle. We're in a spiritual warfare. And we need to be reminded of that every now and then. This is a spiritual warfare. And the spiritual warfare is raging around us. And we see it as believers. But guess what? It's not only raging physically in the physical world in which we live. It's raging inside here. Inside your head. The battle is raging. For the spirit warth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. That's inside. And you need to know that so that you might be able to push back against those inclinations, those behavioral inclinations that, that are constantly being seduced and allured or alluring you away from God. It's happening all the time. All the time. And so the source of our spiritual power is in the living word of God. Nothing but the word of God is the means by which you are able to stand. Nothing. God will cause us to stand. Look at verse 8. He says, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true. He says, no matter what the report is on you. Because some of us are going to call us evil. And some of us will say, you know, that's a great guy. So what? He says, no matter what the report is, the source is true. Is the truth of God's word. It's interesting. He, he makes a contrast here between a good and bad again. By glory and dishonor. By evil reports, good reports. Regarded as deceivers and yet true. It's a paradox. But the paradox is a contrast or a contrasting of two realities. And it highlights that the world and this age is seeking to disrupt our relationships through bad reports. And so I want you to know, as the attacks increase, it may come on you. And they'll take a picture of you, put it on the head of somebody else. And then through AI, make the lips move, you saying something that you did not say, or engaging in something that you would never engage in, in order to discredit your testimony. So stand by, that stuff is coming. You know, they have the technology to do that today. So be careful. This goes on, he says in verse 9. As unknown and yet well known. As dying yet beholding. We live as punished and yet put to death. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing yet possessing all things. This is a contrast. He's contrasting that these things are so, but they do not determine whether we are consistently in servitude to Christ. I do not serve him based upon how good it is. I serve him because he's God. And he's called me into this relationship with him. 
And we need to understand that. The time for understanding of this truth is now more than ever. Because we're living in a time where this juxtaposition is true. But if you don't see it, you won't recognize the challenge that we have living in this world today. And the challenge is that we are inundated with all kinds of allurements and attractions and seductions from the world. Sophisticated techniques that are designed to appeal to us psychologically, that sociologically brings benefit if we would just trust them. Serve me, the devil says, and I'll bless you with success. And many are selling out for success as defined by the world. Did you know that? And many of the kids are calling them those people who have sold out to the Illuminati. That's what they're saying. Oh, he sold out to the Illuminati. You know what they're saying? He gave his soul to the devil in order to get successful, to be successful. That stuff is going on. Some of us, you know, us old folk, we don't pay attention to that stuff, but it's going on. Look at verse 11. Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. Now, in a like exchange, I speak as to children open wide you, or open wide to us also. Now listen, this is interesting. He says that the restraining that takes place in our spiritual growth is because of our own affections for the things of the world. Now, quietly, we're looking at the, at, at the world and we're defining success by how the world defines it. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. A lot of us is doing that. In order to be successful, you've got to have, you know, a, a certain square footage of house, a specific kind of vehicle. You know, I had a person tell me, you know, buy a Volvo. It's, it's a status car. I don't even like Volvos. Right? Yeah. You know, give me anything that rolls. You know. Uh, you know, so we're, we're looking and defining success based upon uh, what brand of clothes we buy. Well, this is a Gucci. You know, uh, I got, uh, you know, uh, E. Saint Laurent's tennis shoes. You know, whatever. And we define success the way the world defines it. Not here. Paul says, wait a minute. If you are restrained in your maturity and in your growth, it's because of your misplaced affections on the things of the world. Things of the world. He said, but rather I will have you open wide and receive from us the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if this message has a powerful Conclusion, it starts in verse 14. Amen? Take a look at verse 14. It says, do not, men and women, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what fellowship or partnership have the righteousness that you have in Christ Jesus and lawlessness that is out in the world or what fellowship has light with darkness? Righteousness doesn't have fellowship with lawlessness. Light doesn't have any fellowship with darkness. And you should not be bound unequally with those who are outside the body of Christ. Now this needs some explanation. Because we're in the world and we're in relationship with unbelievers all the time. Notice the word bound. Bound together. I think King James says yoke together. A yoking together means that the two of you are on the same pathway and in agreement with whatever that pathway is. He said, don't do that. Don't do that. Let's look at a couple of scriptures I think that would point us to that fact. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. A principle is laid out here. And Deuteronomy... And verse 20, I mean, chapter 22 and verse 10. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. 
God says to the nation of Israel, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. That's a principle. Now, why would he say that? The gate of an ox is different from the gate of a donkey, right? The power of an ox is different from the power of a donkey. In fact, when you yoke them together, it's the ox who's going to be doing all the work. Donkey just going to be on for the ride. If he can keep up, right? He says, don't do that because it produces an unacceptable result. An unacceptable result. That principle is carried over here into the New Testament by the Apostle Paul, who was an Israeli out of the tribe of Benjamin who understood and read Deuteronomy. And so he brings that principle over into the believer's relationship with the world. And he says, do not be bound with unbelievers. Because you represent righteousness and they represent lawlessness. And the two will pull in two different directions. Listen to what he says. To join with an unbeliever will distort all of life's circumstances and will distort your ministry. The ministry is that which God has connected you to when he saved you. That ministry is the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will be distorted. That will be uh, disconnected from your priorities. And now you're pursuing that which you are yoked with. Stay with me. Deuteronomy suggests to us that you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. We cannot live the kind of life that God wants us to live if you're yoked up with an unbeliever. Now, we must consider we must consider this in situations that are significant in terms of control of our lives. When we are in partnership or in fellowship with someone and they are pursuing an agenda that controls our priorities, controls our, our, our getting up and going out, our coming in and going out, then that thing is controlling you. The actions would be a willingly submission, to willingly submit to the, the, the priorities of that person. If I'm in fellowship or in a business with a guy who's an unbeliever, then we have priorities that have been set out we have an agenda and goals and visions that we are pursuing and if he is the dominant person in that relationship even if he's a subordinate person in that relationship he may say well i don't think that's the way we should go i think this is a better way to go and he is persuasive enough to convince you that okay we'll go that way and that way may be against the purposes of god i'm just giving you a scenario right and it becomes the controlling feature and the unbeliever is the means by which we voluntarily submit to things that are outside the will and purpose of God. And the scripture talks about this repeatedly over and over again. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse, uh, I think it is 9 and 10. Paul says to the Corinthians, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Hear that? Not to associate with immoral people. Let me give you an example of Christians who are associating with immoral people. They have a friend who is gay. They like them. They have you know, fellowship with each other. They enjoy one of each other's company. But the Christian is clearly not, you know, in that kind of lifestyle, but they have a relationship with that person. What generally happens, now hear me, is that a sensitivity to that lifestyle in that person becomes more real in that, that Christian's life 
and they're not so against it because their friend is a homosexual. Whereas they do not publicly necessarily endorse it, but they are sensitive and accepting of it to the extent that they do not speak out against it. Do you know people like that? I know parents who are like that. Christians, but my son, I still love him. Yeah, you can love him, but you, can, you, you must condemn what is condemned by God. Amen. I love your son, but your lifestyle is wrong. It's against God and against God's purpose. This is what Paul is saying here. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with immoral people of this world or with the covenant, covetous and swindlers and with idolaters for then you would have to go out of the world. Now here in I think is an explanation of what it means not to be bound together with them. He's saying you're in the world, you're going to have relationship with these people, you're going to see them and you're going to know that they're there and in some instances you might have to do some business with them. That's different from being bound together with them. Do you see that? The difference is what Paul says being bound together with them as opposed to being in the world and having to touch and, and to deal with the reality that they're there. So that means you may be on a job pursuing a career and you're going to have co-workers around you who are swindlers, <laughs> idolaters. They're around you. That Paul said, don't leave. You stay in there and you may have some influence. But don't be bound together with them in the pursuit of an agenda that is antithetical to that which is specified within the word of God. Simple as that. Simple as that. And there are other scriptures that are used that Paul uh, points to that tells us that we should not be yoked together. But be in, but it, it doesn't mean you come out the world. Look at verse 10 again. I did not at all mean with immoral people of this world or with covetous and swindlers or with idolaters for then you would have to go out the world. He's not talking about that. What he's saying is defined more specifically in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be bound, verse 14. Do not be bound together with them. There's a difference. Look at it. He says uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, go back there and verse 4, 14. He says, do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership, what fellowship have righteousness, and we are the righteousness of God, and lawlessness, that's the unbeliever who does not know God, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belia? Belia is Satan. That's another word for Satan. So the answer is none. I think the answer is resounding. There's no relationship that we have with them. Their agenda is quite different from the agenda of God. Their purposes do not fit the purposes of God. And you and I are in pursuit of what? The purpose of God. In our lives and in his kingdom. In our lives and in his kingdom. Look at verse 16. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? He introduced the idea of a temple. What fellowship, he's asking, do we have with the unbeliever? With those who are against God? Then he says... What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Temple. He's talking about us. So we must be a temple. The temple of the living God. Go to Colossians chapter 2. And 
And in chapter 2, look at verse 9. For in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. We've been made complete in him. In him, Christ, dwells the fullness of the purposes of God, and the purposes of God is dwelling in us. That makes us the temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, not 2 but 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and look at verse 19. Real specific here. Real specific. Are you turning? Look at it. Or do you not know that your body, come on somebody, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Wow. And so Paul is saying to us, you are the temple of the living God. What fellowship or agreement do you have with the things that are outside the will and purpose of God? None. Absolutely none. And this is important. Because many of us have made commitments, pledges, and relationships with Demonic activities and demonic groups. You say, well, how is that so? Anybody in here pledge a fraternity? I did. I did. And if you look at those secret societies, they're all created out of a demonic idea. And what happens is that you make a pledge. And that's why you got to repent and say, God, forgive me for that. You made a pledge to what? You pledged to something. Some of us don't know. I just pledged because I want to get in. No. And then you get in and you don't trust God anymore. You trust your sorority sister or your fraternity brother to help you get a job, to help you get some position. And, and when you're trusting anybody but God, it's demonic. I repented. I don't hold it up as something that I'm proud of. You know, I'm telling you that was wrong at a time. I wasn't saved when I did that, by the way. When I got saved and God began to tell me, that's an area you need to disconnect from. Others of you have done that with other organizations. Kiwanas or whatever. Different groups that you've made up. Pledge, secret society, Prince Hall, and the Masons. And you know the Masons, you know, when you get to the 33rd degree, you're, they're going to tell you, we are worshiping Satan. They'll tell you that Amen. right out the box. Right. Our God is Satan. Now all those other fraternities and stuff, all that comes out of an Egyptian ideology. Egyptian gods and secret society. And that's what the Masons are. They're, they're submitted to Egyptian gods. And that's why they got all those Egyptian symbols and stuff. Do you guys see that? That's who they're worshiping. And the fraternities and the sororities are doing the same thing. I know that's going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble with the Omega Fives and all those guys. Right? It's true. If you study the Bible, you'll see. Verse 17, back to 2 Corinthians, verse 17. Therefore, don't have fellowship with him. Now listen to this. If you're in these groups, if you pledged and you're a member of those groups, therefore come out from among them. Come out. Come out from their midst and be what? Separated, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. You are holy in Christ. 
You don't touch it. That means you don't embrace it and submit to it. When you do, it's controlling some facet or dimension of your life. Right? And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This is a promise from God. The promise of the presence of God depends clearly on Christian separation from the things of the world. As he has listed it here. The promise of the presence of God. Sometimes, look, we're in the family of God, but we're not in fellowship with God because we got some stuff that we need to get rid of. Amen? I'm going to tell you. You may be born again. There's no question about it. But you want to have fellowship. And you want the presence of God operating in your life. That means you've got to look at what's going on in my life that may be interfering with my relationship with God. That, that runs obstruction to the power of God operating in me and through me. You say, well, how could that be? You know you can be in the family and be alienated from the family? A son or daughter who's gone left and have left the family? They're in the family. Their, their, their status, their membership does not change. That's still a son, that's still a daughter. But they're not in fellowship with mom and dad. Same thing happens in the family of God. That we have rebelled against something that God has said. And so we have broken the connection that God wants with us. Not because he broke it, because we broke it. There's been times when I was raising my kids that I had to put them on punishment. Punishment means that they were separated from some of the benefits and accoutrements of the family. They didn't have access to the refrigerator. They didn't have access to the television. They didn't have access to the other things that were in the house for convenience and necessity. They had to, they were restricted to their room. Still in the family. Still in the house. But they didn't have access. If you want access in the family of God, listen to what he says. Separate yourself from all these other things. And then I will be your father and you will be my sons. Clearly, Christian separation or separate themselves from the moral impurities of the world gives us moral access to God. The separation is from the impurities and the immoralities of the world. We don't do what the world does. You know, we're not living together to test it out first. That's the world. We don't do that. Well, we used to not do that as Christians. But how many are doing that now? I need to kick the tire first. See if it works. That's not what God would have us do. So clearly, when you read this in its totality, we recognize that we are an intimate part of the movement and purpose of God. Go back to verse 1 again, because this is the launching pad into this whole discussion in chapter 6. In verse 1. In verse 1, Paul begins with reminding us that we are in Fellowship with God. We are working together. It is a, a relationship of intentionality. A relationship that is defined by how we work with him. And then he tells us he urged. And that's urgency here at this point speaks of, a, of an emergency or a situation that requires immediate attention. I urge you not to receive God's grace. In vain. And then he begins to talk to us about what we ought to look like by telling us what we ought not to be engaged in. Reminding us that we are servants. You see, we don't come to God and demand for him to do for us all the time. God, I, I need, a, I need a, a new wife. Or I want a wife. 
uh, I need a home. Give me a job, by the way, when you're out there looking for a wife for me. I need a good job. And I don't want any old job. I want a job that gives me at least an opportunity for a six-figure income. With three weeks vacation and, uh, you know, two weeks off that I can go to the Super Bowl every year, annually. And we lay out all our wish lists before God. And then we sit back and, and judge him based upon his ability to come up and come through for us. Right? No. Wrong relationship. You come into a relationship where he defines for you what you should be doing. And then he says when you do it, there's a blessing and a benefit for it. Amen? Amen. I think it's clear here, men and women, that in these last days, God is calling to us to another level of commitment. A commitment that is not determined based upon what you see. Chapter 5, we walk by faith and not by sight. We are living out our lives under the auspices of the word of God. Every head bow and every eye closed. Father, we thank you that you called us to a brand new level of commitment. A commitment that is determined based upon our relationship with you and not of the things of the world. You called us to be in the world, but not of the world. And being in the world means that we have a transformed mind, a new priority that governs all that we do, all that we say, and all that we are engaged in. And so we thank you for the call. Now we pray that you give us the capacity and the ability to do what you say. For Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We cannot pursue what you've given to us unless you do it in us. Do in us what we cannot do apart from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. And in this time of instruction, the word of God, that you've heard something that may challenge you to evaluate your relationship with God. And I think that's an ongoing exercise. Where am I in my relationship with God? Can I improve? Yes, we all can improve. And so we pray that these words today will cause you to make a self-examination. Am I in fellowship with some ideas or with some people that I may not need to be yoked up to? And then ask God to deliver and he will do it. Ask him to deliver and he will give you the ability and the capacity to do so. So call upon him. Join us again next Sunday as we explore and investigate another aspect of God's expectation for our lives. God bless you. See you next week.